then that wonderful Relief Society president said, Relief Society women do not like empty cupboard shelves. We'll fill them. And we went about doing that. We had two weeks to do it. The night the Gertlers came, they showed the appearance of someone who shed many tears. And all the way up the staircase to the second floor, I remember Brother Gertler saying, Now it isn't much, Hans, it isn't much, but it's the best we could do. It's the best we could do. And then they opened the door. Talk about a vision. There was a nice carpet laid by my counselor, who was a contractor for carpet laying. And then there was the wallpaper all nice and new and painting nice. There was the Christmas tree all decorated. Absolutely everything anyone would need. I was 15. I was a very insecure teenager. We had not had a real home since before the war when our apartment building was bombed. So we always had to double up with other families and to walk into an apartment and to know it would be ours was just beyond comprehension to us. It was like a shock. I couldn't believe it. He put the key in front of me and said, you are in your own apartment. As we left, and our little band who had done all this work came out onto the street, and they were silent, and they said, uh, why is it that this will be the best Christmas we've ever experienced? I said, do you remember the final verse of Little Town of Bethlehem? No ear may hear his coming, but in this world of sin, where meek souls will receive him yet, the dear Christ enters in. He entered in to the apartment. He entered into the lives of all who were part of that experience. As Bishop Monson matured in his responsibilities, he learned many lessons, among them the importance of following the Spirit and trusting in the Lord. One night, during a stake priesthood leadership meeting, he had the distinct impression that he should leave the meeting immediately and drive to the Veterans Hospital high on the avenues of Salt Lake City. Before leaving home that night, he had received a phone call informing him that an older member of his ward was ill and had been admitted to the hospital for care. Could the bishop, the caller asked, find a moment to go by the hospital and give a blessing? The busy young bishop explained he was just on his way to a meeting, but he would certainly go by the hospital afterward. Now the prompting was stronger than ever. Leave the meeting and proceed to the hospital at once. Bishop Bonson looked at the pulpit. The stake president was speaking. He didn't see how he could stand in the middle of his talk and make his way over an entire row of men. Painfully, he waited out the final moments of the stake president's message, then bolted for the door even before the benediction was announced. Running the full length of the corridor on the fourth floor of the hospital, the young bishop saw a flurry of activity outside the designated room. A nurse stopped and said, Are you Bishop Monson? Yes, he replied. I'm sorry, she said. The patient was calling your name just before he died. Fighting back tears, Bishop Monson walked back into the night. He vowed at that moment that he would never fail to act upon a prompting from the Lord. He would immediately follow the impressions of the Spirit wherever they led him. No one can understand President Thomas S. Monson who does not understand the frequency, the repetition of those kinds of spiritual promptings in his life and his absolute loyalty in responding to them. When I was called as a bishop, I recognized I was the president of the priest corps and I wanted to get every boy out. There's one boy that never came and I thought to myself, I'm sitting here with the priests, they've got an advisor, I'll leave them 
to get the lesson from the advisor, I'm going to go find Richard Casto. I went over to his home, Mother and Dad were home, and they said he was working over at the West Temple garage. So I went over to Fifth South and West Temple, and the door was open, but nobody there. And so I started looking around, you know, nobody. So I went around the back, and there was one of these old-fashioned grease pits. And I looked down into the darkness, and I could see two eyes looking at me. He said, you got me, Bishop. I'll come up. And he came up out of the grease pit. And uh, we had a nice little visit there together. And I said, uh, Richard, we need you. You have a way with people. And I, I want to have every priest in attendance. Will you come? He said, I'll come. And he came. After that, I served a mission. I was sealed to my wife in the temple. We have five great children. Two of them have served missions. I've served as a bishop twice. My children have a great love for him and my wife has a great love for him because of what he did for me. It was probably one of the greatest blessings that I had ever received in my life. During his service as bishop, two children were born to the Monson family. Tom in 1951, and Anne in 1954. Tom recalls, We felt as though life was very good to us, which it was. About this time, President Joseph Fielding Smith came to reorganize the Temple View State Presidency. On Sunday, June 16, 1955, the general session of State Conference was held in the Assembly Hall on Temple Square. The ironic priesthood and bishoprics were providing the music. Joseph Fielding Smith stepped to the pulpit and announced the new stake presidency. Percy K. Fetzer, president, John R. Burt, first counselor, and Thomas S. Monson, second counselor. He then said, Bishop Monson knows nothing of this calling, but if he will accept it, we will be pleased to hear from him now. So I had to make the long walk from the choir seats down to the pulpit, thinking, what am I going to say? The song we had just sung concerned the word of wisdom. Have courage, my boy, to say no. Have courage, my boy, to say no. And I said, my thing today is have courage, my boy, to say yes. And I do so with my heart and soul. Along with increasing church responsibilities, Tom was progressing in his career as well. In 1953, he was named Assistant General Manager of Deseret News Press. I don't know of anybody that Tom Monson dealt with that didn't love him. All of us in the automobile business and in the real estate business came to know and to love this good man. He just had the ability to reach out and touch hearts. In 1957, Tom and Francis built a new home for their family on a one-acre lot in the suburbs near Salt Lake. The move to a full acre on the outskirts of the city seemed like paradise to the young family. Then on February 21st, 1959, Tom was summoned to the office of Stephen L. Richards of the First Presidency. Thinking this meeting concerned the General Handbook of Instructions, currently being printed, Tom was unprepared for what followed. President Richards called him to serve as president of the Canadian Mission. He indicated he should take a leave of absence from his employment and be prepared to depart in three weeks. When Tom returned home, he found Francis lying down, ill from the pregnancy of their third child. When I told her, there was no question but what she would accept. When we told our children, our son Tommy said, oh boy, when do we go? We said, in about three weeks. He said, great, when do we come back? We said, in about three years. The reality of what was happening became clear. I can still remember the cold, snow-filled day that I rented a truck and we took our furniture from our dream home, prepared to leave Salt Lake City. It was an emotional day for Francis and for all of us. I noted that she uh, stroked the door jam. There were